What is up, Nets fans? Welcome to the Brooklyn Buzz. I'm your host, Nick Faye. With me, Jack Manuel, as always. Special guest, Will Jackson. Guys, how are we doing? I spelt Ronde wrong on my tweet, <laughs> but I don't care. <laughs> what a game. What a oh. game. 123-121. Ronde came up with the game-winning shot. D'Angelo Russell put the squad in his back. 27 in the fourth, guys. Just what's the emotion right now? Pure joy. Yeah. <laughs> The, the synonyms are, are going to be going to plenty. Um, we chat about this. It's it's hard. I, I literally have been working all day. You know, I, I finish at three twenty. I'm like, oh, the Nets are coming back here, chatting to Nick and the Dams. Oh, something's happened. I'll put on the last three minutes, and I'm like, wait, why is Ronde out there? Wait, wait, why is Jared Dudley out there? Jared Dudley now is a deep three. Ronde Hollis Jefferson gets the game winning bucket. D'Angelo Russell is a walking bucket and beats the Sacramento Kings by himself in a quarter. Um, I don't know, man. Just like. This team with capital T, capital T, full stops, capital letters. It's just this this team does something to you, man. They just they just got they got your heart. They've got your heart. Jack, you put it perfect. There's not enough you could say about what happened in that fourth quarter right now. Dude, the emotions in this game were ridiculous. Like the third quarter, this team is down 28 points. Like, and it looks like they're about to get cooked. They played like trash, like straight up. They were lucky to be down only double digits in the first quarter or, or the first half, like eight points or whatever it was. They played like trash in the third, and then they just straight up go fuego mode in the fourth quarter, specifically God. D'Angelo Russell, 45 to 18 in a goddamn NBA quarter. This is the stuff that like fairy tales are made of. <laughs> like, this is we've talked about on the buzz and will's been a big part of this growth as well with otg as well in terms of the nets that there's just these turning points for this team so many times this season and you just don't think that there's going to be those other ones happening you know we get so despondent and i, I know i'm guilty of that i put out a freaking tweet today <laughs> during like the, the third quarter when we're down by 25 or whatever like will the nets win another game this season and um, I think that last point, the Brooklyn buzz did will it so in some weird reason because this was just, it, it's just the stuff that like is going to go down as one of the best moments, not just for Nets fans this season, but this is going to go down as one of the biggest moments of this season. You know, biggest comeback in Nets history, biggest comeback of the season. D'Angelo Russell is just doing things that are unheard of for a guy. And mind you, he's driving pretty well at the same time. Dude, there's – sorry to cut you off, Will. There's no way he shouldn't have gotten, like, two or three and ones in that quarter. He was getting no calls. Like, I have not seen him in his entire career, probably since his rookie season, get in the lane so easily and finish. And he was throwing out a couple different layups that we probably haven't seen so far this season. Yeah, no, D'Angelo's unstoppable tonight. <sighs> and you mentioned the no calls. I mean, credit to Kenny for putting Rondé. I mean, Rondé got a huge no call at the end of that fourth quarter that really should have put him at the line, but – Despite the no cause, man, it was just an epic game all around. It was amazing for Rondé. You know, this is a guy that we all like per, on a personal level, I think. And he's had a rough season in terms of basketball. He goes out there, not only is he a huge part of the comeback in the fourth quarter, but he had the game-winning defensive play to force yeah. the, the step out from Bagley. And then he gets the game-winning bucket in a situation where – you know, like Rondé wasn't supposed to be that guy. He was supposed to hand it off to D'Lo, but D'Lo couldn't get open, and there was only X amount of time on the clock. Boom, he just steps up, and he wins the game for the squad. Yeah, he Correct. explained He explained it in the, in the post-camp press to Michael Grady where he was like he was supposed to get the dribble handoff. Like he, the, the, he was supposed to, you know, initially get the hand in if D'Lo couldn't get it, and then he was supposed to give the handoff to D'Lo. And D'Lo's like, I can't get it, go. And he just goes and he just does it. And then you hear all the hype. For those that haven't seen it, it's going to be on Yes Network's Twitter. And I'm sure they're going to have to bleep it. But for those that haven't seen it, it's just like, you, you do it, man. You do it, my. And yeah. there's plenty of expletives in there. It's the raw emotion of this team uh, p personified. Rondo Hollis Jefferson, he was sort of saying in the post-camp press as well that JV, Jacques Vaughn, the, one of the amazing assistant coaches in Brooklyn, is just like, be ready, man. And it's just... It speaks volumes to the character of a guy like him. Him and Jared Dudley, plus 26 and plus 27 on the night. We don't win this game without those two guys. It, it, it sounds crazy to say at this point of the season that we won a game because of Ronda Hollis Jefferson, Jared Dudley, and of course, D'Angelo Russell. But they were just so instrumental in this. And um, we've always been big fans of Ronda, despite the fact that you know he's had his ups and downs. Um, I thought he had a tremendous season last season. And this moment for him, I mean, you can just point out to the fact that I think a lot goes to Coach Kenny in this sort of aspect as well, just going, look, let's just have a go. Let's see what can happen with Ronde and Jared Dully, all these other guys. Like you mentioned, Nick, with that full forward lineup with um, D'Angelo Russell, the experimentation, the proactivity from, from Coach Kenny deserves a lot of credit as well. 
Yeah, it seriously, it was just like, and maybe this is something that can boost Rondé into maybe a rotation spot or Jared Dudley. And, you know, Jack and I have talked about this. Will, we talked about this. Dudley does an excellent job of setting screens early in the shot clock. And he was a big reason D'Angelo was able to get free in a lot of those layups as he picked off Darren Fox, like closer to the half court line than the three point line. Yeah, Dudley just does so much stuff well on the court. I mean, even on the offensive end, two, two, two really clutch threes in that game. I mean, there's, He's just been outstanding today and yesterday. Uh, I mean, got, go ahead, Jack. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was gonna say, do you extend the rotation just like that one extra man more to a guy like Jared Dudley or Rondé for an extra fifteen minutes for that energy, if need be? You know, we played uh, eleven players tonight, um, and they were all needed in, in, in a sense. So, do you think that Coach Kenny showing that malleability, that adaptability, you know, could we see more minutes for Rondé and Jared Dudley? you know, for the rest of the season and this road trip going forward. I think after the night, you have to try it at least. Yeah, yeah. I think Will's right. You got to at least consider it. And maybe it's not a lock-in. Obviously, Crab was out as well. Napier was out. But I think, you know, you look at Dudley and Rondé, and they provide a different skill set that nobody else really has on the team. You know, you look at Dudley as that stabilizer for the offense, not necessarily a super talented player, but does the dirty work setting screens, moves the ball defensively, willing to take a charge. And you look at Rondé, he's really the only, like, very good athlete at that size we have. And he was able to come in and slow down Marvin Bagley, who pretty much owned the Nets the entire game until Rondé was in there. And – Rondé's not a huge guy, but he brings some type of physicality to the game. Yeah, I think Rondé provides physicality and, and maturity and leadership um, that I think is underrated from, you know, we, we love Rodion's in spades, but I think Rondé has a steadiness about him, which sounds odd to say in comparison in these sort of moments because he has a history with, these, with this team. He has a real history, uh, a really great relationship with a guy like D'Angelo Russell. Um, so I think that he, in all those sort of things just bode well for him. And I'm, um, we've sort of said, you know, do we see Rondé Hollis Jefferson on the team going forward? I think just his relationship with his team, that the, the Brooklyn Nets are going to give him something. Um, and I think that he just showed that and the love and the, 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 the shower. He, we knew he was getting it. Um, and I just, I don't know, I, I can't say enough good things about this team. You know, I know that they, they toy with our emotions. They toy with my emotions. It's up and down. It's a bipolar nature. Um, but I'm heading there in a few weeks and I'll spend all my money on this team to see a playoff <laughs> game. I'll spend all my money on the team to buy all the City Edition jerseys. I'll give it all to Joseph beside Mikhail Prokhorov just to get a glimpse at this team in a playoff setting. Um, it's uh, Words just can't express just how, how much of a ride it's been. It's just this game alone has been a ride. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. Let's let's go to the start, boys. I, I've obviously sort of been, I, I keep an eye on it. Um, you know, with, with bits and pieces with the Bleach Report notifications, the ESPN notifications. Um, starts off pretty poorly, um, up and down moments. How did how what were your thoughts in that first half, so to speak? Like I said, to start the show, I thought they were lucky to be down, you know, not by 20 in the first half. You know, the Kings missed a couple open shots. Uh, the Nets' defense was terrible. Transition defense was bad. Half-court defense was bad. They were pretty much a step slow on every defensive possession. Offensively, you know, they were all over the place. They had good moments. They had bad moments. And they were sloppy with the ball. A couple careless turnovers were straight up not great defense by Sacramento. They just kind of rushed into their sets, falling into the pace a little bit. And just overall, first half was not good. It didn't give you a good vibe. So the third quarter wasn't surprising because the first half wasn't good. Yeah, I wasn't able to watch a lot of the first half. But uh, from what I watched, it just seems that we were lazy. We were lethargic. We were tired. We weren't getting to our spots in time. Uh, yeah, I think Nick put it well. Uh, just not there. How did they keep it so close? I, mean, I heard there were some mini runs here and there. Who was sort of... You know, uh, we know D'Angelo was the dude in the, in the last half, especially that fourth quarter, but who sort of kept things level pegging um, in that sort of first half and, and the latter end of that first half? You know, Joe Harris wasn't too bad. Karis LeVert, I thought, had some pretty good moments in this game as well, just as, like, doing some of the energy, had six assists. Um, overall, it was just like a little guy hitting in there and there. You know, D'Lo wasn't bad in the first half either. He still put up a couple points. It was like, to be honest, one of the players who didn't really play well this game in the first half and it stuck out was Jared Allen. He was getting manhandled by Marvin Bagley, Willie Cauley-Stein, even Harry Giles. So, overall, I thought Jared Allen had a pretty bad game, to be honest. And yeah. uh, kudos there. Sorry to cut you off. But kudos there goes to Coach Kenny from being able to go, look, you know, this guy is a, 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 a sophomore center, should be making more of an impact, should be rebounding more, should have more physicality. And it's just like, no, we're going to go to the likes of Jared Dudley and Wanda Hollis-Jefferson. But, uh, Will, what were your thoughts? 
No, I was just going to say that Jared Allen was struggling with the rebound a lot. And, uh, we also didn't see a lot of Ed Davis, only 13 minutes tonight. Uh, I just thought that we struggled a lot in that first half with rebounding too. Yeah, their athletic bigs just cause a lot of problems for Ed Davis. Like, he didn't play well either. And I literally was on the cusp of tweeting something out like, oh, maybe Ed Davis should get started minutes tonight. But then I watched him for a few minutes, and I was like, honestly, both these guys are getting cooked. I was like, Rondé might be make sense of the small ball five because – Will, even Willie Colley Stein's not like a dominant center, where like that's why D'Angelo, I think, had so much success driving inside, is they don't have really an amazing rim protector. They're good athletic bigs, but they're almost a little bit more offensive minded when it comes to Bagley and Giles. And Willie Colley Stein's just kind of all over the place, inconsistent. Yeah, I think that you might, you both make some really valid points there. Ed Davis, four personal fouls in 13 minutes. So um, I think it, it shows now that we have a few more sort of mini weapons in the arsenal if things do go badly on the boards because we know Ronda Hulse Jefferson in 17 minutes, five rebounds, you know, uh, most rebounds on the team other than Jared Allen. But obviously we expect that and want that from him. Um, so moving to the second half, boys, uh, that third quarter, uh, it, it seemed to just get worse. You know, only 20 points outscored by 17. <laughs> For the Sacramento Kings, was it just the same old that nothing could really happen? Nothing was clicking on either end? I want to say they started off the third quarter on a 20-0 run, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you're right. Like, <laughs> that's how bad it was. It was just like everything was going wrong. Sacramento was knocking down all their shots. The Nets were missing shots. They usually knocked down. They're turning over the ball, just lazy. I mean, if you asked me in the third quarter if the Nets were going to come back, I would have told you straight up no. I was getting ready to like transition into doing some like OTG work and keeping it on in the background. But then all of a sudden, they started – even when they were, like, down, the Sacramento had it at, like, the high 20. So they were making, like, a small push where you saw the energy pick up. So then the fourth quarter, it's like, all right, if they can get this within 15, maybe they can make a run. Yeah, and, I mean, in that third quarter, just the defense wasn't there. Sacramento was hitting every single shot. I think Marvin Bagley started 11-11 from the field. Uh, it was just a struggle all around that third quarter, and we weren't hitting anything. Uh, it was just a brutal, brutal third quarter. It and that's it. It just it, tra it, it transitioned into one of the greatest quarters in Brooklyn Nets history. Um, how did it be? When did the the momentum start to turn? When did D'Lo get things going? How did like forty five to 18, 45 points in a twelve minute span is ridiculous. Let alone twenty eight from one of them. Um, you talk us through. Let's break this down, lads. All right, to start off the fourth, it was just good. Like, things just started moving. I think they started the fourth on, like, a 19-6, to six, and the biggest run they ended up having is 30-7. to seven. Like, that's a they went on a 30-7 to seven run in a quarter in an NBA game, which is just crazy. D'Angelo was, like, heating up early in the fourth. Then midway through that fourth quarter, he just caught straight fuego. Also think one thing that stuck out, I Harry Giles – Got into it with Rodion's a little bit, and he pissed off the Nets. He pissed off Rodion's, and I saw D'Lo say something to him. So I feel like that almost awakened him a little bit, like maybe the Kings were talking shit. And then all of a sudden, D'Lo looked a little bit angry. Like, yeah. the first time I saw angry D'Lo, and he freaking yeah. went at them, hard body. And, like, this has to maybe be his career high for points in the pain. If not, it's 100% a season high. Yeah. And, Jack, you asked about the turning point. I mean, when the Nets rolled out of the lineup of Rondé, Dudley, D'Lo, and Trevon Graham. I mean, that's – you don't expect it, but that's when the Nets really started to turn things around. I <laughs> yeah. mean, Rondé got two steals and a block, shot six – shot six of seven. I mean, it was just insane when that lineup went in. And what do you – if you were in Coach Kenny's shoes, would you have just it, – it, was this a surprise to you? I mean, you got to think – I mean, anytime you go on a 37 run, you're, it's definitely a surprise. I mean, guys stepped up. I think it was like the combination of just playing so many players that are like similar size, you know, from like a six, seven to a six, eight range. And then you have D'Lo out there creating and they depended on him and doing a lot. Most of the other points came Rondé in transition or just cuts to the rim. Dudley hit a few threes, but overall it was just a lot of D'Angelo, but what it did defensively just gave them a lot of switch ability because Sacramento did a good job with like backdoor cuts in this game. A lot of the nets to switch a little bit more also gave them four bodies that could rebound. Yeah, boys, um, I'm, I'm scrolling Twitter because obviously it's going off. Nets Twitter is a wonderful place at the best of times. But in, when it's coming after a win like this um, and someone has posted Nicky Boy 12 underscore, um, there's a video post game. for I'm sure we've probably seen it. D'Angelo Russell going, I'm built for this shit. And goddamn yeah. right he's built for this shit. <laughs> Ice in his veins. This is oh, the man. best 
performance I've seen from D'Lo, obviously, in his entire career was his career high. But there was a point where he just took over the game where it was like I was watching one of these elite players just get hot and not be able to be stopped because there are points where Sacramento was throwing double, triple teams at him, and he was finding a way to get to the rim and score. And it was just incredible to watch, and it's just amazing for the Nets to have a player this caliber. Yeah, what sticks out to me is uh, he had 12 assists tonight. And, like The play that stuck out to me was about two minutes left. I think the Nets were down two, and D'Lo could have taken a contested three, but instead he kicked it to a wide-open Dudley who knocked down the deep three to go to the lead. And I think that just shows a lot about his character late in games. Yeah, there was a couple of passes in this game that were incredible. Some of them were in, you know, I guess, quote-unquote, garbage time, but there was like a no-look pass at Karras in the first quarter that was fire. He's just so ridiculously talented. It's We, we expected – I'll put a sort of more ex- existential question to both of you guys. We obviously did our season previews of D'Angelo Russell. We said 17 and 7, 17 and 8, something like that, Nick. Um, and, and he's around those sort of marks. He's scoring a little bit more. Did you expect this out of him? Uh, I'll go with you first, Nick. Did you expect these sort of outbursts from him? Do we expect this amount of greatness, the all-star level, these sort of nights? And for those that are playing along at home, 44 points is the most points scored by Brooklyn Net in the Nets era, so since 2012-13. Honestly, not this season. You know, I thought this was a possibility for him to have. I think he this is his third 40-plus point game on the road for the Nets. I didn't expect him to get to this all-star type level. Like we talked about on the preview show, Jack, that we thought the Nets had a good record he'd get in the all-star game. That did happen. But I didn't expect him to get to the point where he is dominating the game and putting the team on his back to get you a W. Like he's had moments against Cleveland, but this game was completely different. Like the Kings are a solid team, and they made an effort to literally stop him, and they couldn't. Yeah, I mean, nobody going into the season could have said that they would expect a 44-point outing to uh, cap a 28-point comeback. But, um, I mean, we knew that D'Angelo Russell had it in him. We knew that he could be something in this league, and I, I'm glad he's finally showing it. But uh, I didn't expect it this soon. I think Magic you know, is probably puking right now. Like, you, you, uh, you traded this guy for essentially cap space. Yeah, you got Kyle Kuzma, but whatever. That's just anybody could have drafted him. He was a late first-round pick. It's it's pretty beautiful, just everything that's happening with D'Angelo Russell's growth and, and our girl at OTG, Karen, um, isn't having the, fun, the the best of times, cries in her Lakers fan purple and gold tears. Uh, so she's not having the best of time, but as a black and white Nets fan, this is it's pretty beautiful. But in terms of D'Angelo Russell's persona, guys, we see him now in almost embracing this hate, especially away from home. He's, he's, he's Patrick Beverly-like in the way he's, you know, he's throwing his hand around his ear and he's embracing this new ice cold persona and the fact that he wants to break the opposing team's hearts he wants to break the opposing fans hearts he's doing that consistently on a consistent basis and in the past we sort of said of him that you know we wanted to be more of a leader less timid and obviously you know that was him finding his way not only as a player in this nba but as a man and now he's just seems to be just growing into this not only great basketball player but this great teammate great person, all the things he does outside the NBA. But uh, it seems to me that, you know, we, we sort of compare it. You, if you want to make a comparison to a guy like Kyrie Irving, Kyrie Irving's 26 years old. And in the environment that he's in Boston, you'd expect him to thrive. And he has to an extent. But I think D'Angelo has almost embraced Brooklyn and Brooklyn has embraced him. And it's turned him into not only this tremendous basketballer, but this tremendous man. Yeah, I 100% agree, and I got it from a couple points. I think anytime something like, I guess, quote-unquote bad happens to you in life, it kind of forces you to grow up. Getting traded from the Lakers to the Nets kind of forced him to grow up a little bit sooner. And then obviously, I think his development as just a human, you know, growth as an adult, he's really accepted himself a little bit more, and he's putting the work, and he's taking the strides. And he talked about it, you know, even in an interview with Woj, that, you know, when he was drafted, he didn't know how to be professional. Now he does. He knows how to put in the work. And he feels more confident, and he feels more confident in being himself. And I think that's allowing him to be a better leader. Yeah. I mean, D'Angelo also said the trade to Brooklyn was probably one of the best things that's ever happened to him. And we see him carry himself with a certain kind of swagger now, especially as the Nets are starting to win more. And, I mean, it's just what you want out of your leader. It's what you want out of the guy who's closing your games. I think it's going to be the most used gift for the next couple of weeks at least. I'm built for this shit. Like it's good. <laughs> it, it's 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 a life motto. Uh, it just gives me confidence. It gives me goosebumps. Um, just seeing this team and D'Angelo Russell rise. It's you know it, on a lot of guys, a lot of you know media pundits in general have been down on this team and just in terms and of obviously down on Kilo in general. 
Oh yeah, it's it's tremendous the amount of you know general NBA pundits that will just be you know oh he's just a scorer he can only shoot mid ranges on look at his effective field goal percentage but you look <laughs> you look you just look beyond the stats when it comes to these sort of guys and these and you know you can argue with Trey Young as well he's sort of started season I think that basketball analytics over overshadows a lot of the the greatness that some of these guys have within them and it's almost like. And I think the Nets themselves have probably been a little bit guilty of that, be it Coach Kenny or the coaching staff or, or anything. But D'Angelo Russell has been able to thrive and turn into this leader. And I, I think that the trust within the organization, and he's just been able to, he is the leader. And I think, was it Spencer Dinwiddie that was in an interview that said it with Woj, Nick? Yes. He was so, in the or it, yeah. Well, uh, Dinwiddie was in there and he mentioned him being the leader. And then also Karis LeVert mentioned both of those guys being leaders too. So, I mean, it's it bodes well going forward that, you know, we have a guy in the wings, like a, a Spencer Dinwiddie, but then we have D'Angelo Russell putting out 28 performance, 28 points, you know, in just a bloody quarter. It's, it still boggles the mind that um, we won this game. I'm just excited to see D. Like, I feel more confident about the Nets making the playoffs than I did maybe at the third quarter of this game just because of D'Angelo. And I think this is a big positive momentum boost for them for the rest of the road trip. You know, they got to take care of business against the Lakers. Portland's going to be without CJ. Philadelphia hasn't been amazing. So there is wins out there from the get. And I just think the confidence for D'Angelo finishing off this stretch and going to the postseason, I'm excited to see what he can do. Yeah, I can't wait. Now, in terms of uh, speaking more broadly about D'Angelo Russell, does this, does this game earn him a max contract, lads? It's the, it's the body of work, and this is something you add in there, and I think he was already getting close to on the cusp of it. I think he's going to be right around the max. I don't know if he'll get exactly the max. He might take a slight discount for the Nets, but I would expect him not to hit free agency. I think the deal will be one of those deals that's done right at you know twelve oh one, or it's right right before free agency starts. Yeah, I mean, I think that he's earned a lot of money just throughout the season, not just this and game. 12. <laughs> it's oh man, it's it's insane to say. And uh, Hardwood Proxies and HP Basketball is put on Twitter. If Thunder take down one of the Raptors or the and the Jazz beat the Hawks, I'm pretty sure the Nets and D'Lo will be in a position to eliminate the Lakers officially from the playoffs on oh, Friday. Oh. That would be poetic justice if I've ever heard it in my life and um, it's it's funny how this game works sometimes but you know I, I think you know you compare it to D'Angelo to his two buddies in Car Anthony Towns who is continuing to grow and is absolute tremendous force Devin Booker has had his moments this season and I sort of hark back to that game against the Golden State where he showed some real leadership but I'd still rather have a, a ball handler passing scoring savants that in D'Angelo Russell so I mean if Devin Booker can get one, but I think that, like you said, Nick, he'd be willing to take that discount. But uh, are there any more little tidbits from this game that you wanted to mention, guys? Anything uh, that stuck out, um, positive or negative? I, I'm just going to say I definitely am not sleeping well tonight. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to be juiced up. Uh, overall, like, there's not really much to say. The fact is the Nets were pretty bad for the first three quarters, and they got an incredible performance from five guys, specifically D'Angelo Russell, and they just took another – you know, just another add to their belt. And I think it's just a really big win. Like, this has to be one of the biggest wins of the season, if not the biggest, just the fact that we're down 28 on the road and they came back to win. And like I said, the Kings are not a bad team. Like, they're not going to make the playoffs. Right. They're right on the cusp. If they're in the East, they're probably getting in the playoffs. So, like, I, this this to me is just one of those things that's really great for the franchise, the organization, and it's just going to boost the team. Yeah, I mean, not much negatives to take on after that fourth quarter that we had. I mean, obviously, you could take out some negatives from the first three quarters. I mean, there was a lot to take out from. But just out of that fourth quarter, you just have to be confident with what you're rolling in for the next couple weeks. It, it's great for Kenny and the coaching staff, too. It's like, hey, you know, we played, like, absolute garbage. If we played, like, a moderately below average third quarter, we would have won this game by 10 points or we would have only had to outscore them 35 to 19 or whatever. So I think, like, there's still a lot of work to do, but there's a lot of positives to take away from such a bad performance for majority of the game. What is the likelihood of come down, an emotional come down, uh, when we head to the Lakers on Friday? I will say one thing that sucks is there's two days in between this game. The Nets would benefit if it was a back-to-back -back or if it was they were playing them on Thursday instead of Friday. But I think, like, they have to carry this. And luckily, they don't really have much travel still being the state of California for pretty much the whole week. Yeah, I mean, hopefully LeBron is rested. Let's see <laughs> if we can get lucky with that. He was uh, rested tonight. Load um, management. Yeah, load management. <laughs> um, I mean, it's possible that 
we have a little bit of an emotional letdown over the next two days, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. That's all you can really say. Yeah, it's it's so hard to predict this game. We sort of spoke about it and we touched on it that, you know, the analytical elements, you know, having the rest. Nick spoke about it in terms of uh, before we had this massive road trip, that the, the fact that there is rest involved does bode well to an extent. There's a positive in, in the sort of negative aspect of it all. But, you know, you can't predict what's going to happen. You can't predict the 28 point quarter from one play. You can't predict the 45 point quarter. You can't predict Ronda Hills Jefferson with a game winner. But um, should, do you mind, Nick, if I end with a Stephen A. Smith tweet? Yeah, I guess you're allowed, I guess, in this room. <laughs> It's positive. It's positive. One, one quick note, though. Three games in the next nine days. So the Nets have no excuse not to be energized for the next couple games. Hopefully that bodes well as well. Big rest fan. I know Nick's not going to be getting much tonight, but hopefully the Nets certainly do. Stephen A. Smith, one of um, Nick Busing's favorite fans. Uh, <laughs> o- OMG, four exclamation points. Just when I thought I ran out of compliments for the at Brooklyn Nets. I like how he added them. Comma, he, he put a space between the comma, mind you. So he's emotional as well. I like this. These boys just erased a 25-point deficit, deficit to start the fourth quarter. D'Angelo, he spelled D'Angelo, D-E, Angelo. <laughs> <laughs> For us, was spectacular in all caps lock with 44, W forward slash. For the game and 27 in the fourth before Hollis Jefferson win it. Sensational performance. Dot hashtag taking over NY. I mean, we got to get Stephen A. Smith. A1 grammar. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hashtag, we got to get Stephen A. Smith on the buzz, lads. I mean, he's been giving the net some good hype. So I guess I appreciate it. Obviously, his takes are all over the place. He doesn't know how to spell D'Angelo. So that's great, too. <laughs> 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 but uh, whatever, we'll take him right now. When we took a lot of hate. And, like, I'm just so happy for D'Angelo. Like, I know we talked about him a ton. But, like, so many people still, like, try to throw him down and say that he can't finish in the paint. And, like, the fact that he just scored so many points in the paint makes me so happy. Free throws as well. It's just, I mean, it's it's perfect. This is just, um, I, I can't say any more good things, positive things, um, but making sure you subscribe to this damn thing because we're riding with this team. 100% iTunes, Block Talk Radio, OTG Basketball.com, Netsrepublic.com, Dash Radio, and YouTube. Jack, Will, pleasure as always. Big thanks to everybody listening, and go Nets. We're built for this shit. <laughs>